Hello, welcome to our virtual worship service today at St. Andrew United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Jonathan, and we're glad that you've chosen to be with us today. During this time, you'll hear a call to worship, a pastoral prayer, and a scripture lesson. Before we begin, I want to invite you, if you haven't already, to go ahead and download your worship bulletin for this week. That way you can follow along with us. And I also want to remind you that there are a few different links in the email that you want to click on, as well as this service. You'll be able to find a link for our music and a link for our children's message. So we hope that uh, you'll click on those, that you'll be blessed by our worship this week. In addition to our weekly message, there's also an opportunity for you to get plugged in through our small group ministry. We meet every Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m., via Zoom. So literally anyone in the world can participate in the ministry that we have. And if you have questions or if you are interested in getting connected, you can just call the church office. We would be happy to help you get plugged in. And so uh, with that being said, it's time for us to begin our time together in worship. And we're going to have a call to worship. Mr. Pepper Harrison is our liturgist for us this week, and so he will lead uh, the leader's part, and then I will respond with the congregational response, and so you can join me in the bold part that you'll find on your worship bulletin with us today. Before I do the call to worship, I, I want to give you greeting. Uh, it's been such a good while since we've all been together, for me and you at least, and uh, I'm just so grateful that the pastor asked me to help him with this today. It's a joy to uh, be in this sanctuary. Uh, it's a joy to share with you uh, the things that we're about to share with you. I um, also want to take a moment to thank our bishop and our conference for reappointing uh, Pastor Jonathan Deerdorf to continue to be our spiritual leader uh, and the pastor of this flock. It's uh, such a pleasure, Jonathan, to have you and uh, we give thanks to God for your wisdom and your strength during these very troubling times. And now let me invite you to the uh, call to worship. Come to me, Jesus invites. We come to you. Come to me if you are tired. We come to you. Come to me if you carry burdens. We come to you. Come and discover rest for your souls. Pastor has also asked that I would give the pastoral prayer. So let me invite you now to be in prayer with me. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we pause at the beginning of this worship time to acknowledge you and certainly to invite your presence among us, for you have said that where two or three are gathered together, there you would be in the midst of them. And while there's only four of us in this room today, we know that our brothers and sisters are congregated in their homes and in other places, and so as this branch of the family, we come to you in worship, and we thank you for that. God, you're so good to us. You favor us when we should not be favored. You give us mercy when we don't deserve it. And you bring grace to our very souls. And for that, we are so thankful. These are very troubled times. And we keep seeking answers. And we know that the day will come when you will bring restoration and restore the peace that we all need to live as one in this nation called the United States. Lord, during this time in our own congregation, we've been touched so deeply. Three of our precious brothers have left us and now abide with you. And while we miss them so, we are so grateful that today they are alive and well in your presence. There are others in our congregation who are hurting who are ill, who are suffering in different ways. 
And again, dear God, I pray for your grace and your mercy upon them. Pray for the leaders of our nation and of our state and of our county and of our city, that these people would recognize you and look to you for guidance. In this service today, may we listen to your word, hear your word, and receive your word, that we may walk closer with you in this experience of life. And now, God, we all pray together. As you taught us to pray, when the disciples said, Lord, how should we pray? And you said, pray like this. Our Father, Father who, art who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation. For thine is the kingdom and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading today in preparation for the pastor's message comes from the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of a woman this is that's touching him. She is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something I want to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which one of them would love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for your feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven, hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Pepper, for leading us in worship today. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Loving God, we thank you for your word and how it speaks into our lives. I pray that this day each of us will reflect upon the scripture that we've heard, that we've listened to that your spirit will, will stir our hearts and minds and that we will each find ourselves in the story and consider how you're shaping our lives right now in this very moment to be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. 
And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Simon, not Simon Peter, Simon the Pharisee, but not your typical Pharisee. Based upon our initial impression, Simon isn't arrogant or condescending or pretentious or condemning. Instead, he is willing to take a risk. Simon knows Jesus' reputation. He knows that Jesus has openly criticized his own religious sect, the Pharisaical party. Simon knows that Jesus has a reputation for eating with Gentiles and tax collectors and sinners. Jesus regularly breaks table fellowship laws in order to eat with people who have been excluded. And so Simon knows that by inviting Jesus to his home, he is potentially inviting trouble. Now, this wasn't just an invitation to come over for a bite to eat at, like we would invite the preacher to come over on a Sunday afternoon, even though I think that's a great idea. And I, just so you know, I, I really like chocolate cake and fresh pot of coffee. But anyways, this was a, a more formal gathering. This was a banquet where individuals would receive an invitation, presumably some of Simon's peers, maybe some of his colleagues, reputable people in the community who he would invite, invite to come to his home and enjoy this sacred meal. And it seems that Jesus was probably his guest of honor since it was pretty common to invite a teacher of wisdom to come to a meal, to host a banquet, and for him to expound upon scripture for everyone to listen and as we hear this story, it seems to fit the social situation very well. We know that in antiquity, that in addition to inviting specific guests, that a host would keep their doors open so that anyone could come off the street. If someone was poor or destitute, they might be able to come in and kind of sit along the wall, I guess, to be able to get some scraps from the table that's left over. And, and that seems to be precisely what this woman is doing. She's come in off of the street, but instead of sitting along the perimeter of the, the wall on the other side of the room, she immediately goes towards Jesus. And it becomes apparent that she has not been trained. She doesn't know the etiquette for this kind of a gathering. She simply sits down at Jesus' feet, and she begins to wash Jesus' feet with her hair and with her tears. We come to find that these are tears of gratitude. She's blessed. She's thankful. She's grateful for who Jesus is, which seems to indicate that Perhaps she had already encountered Jesus in some way. And as they're reclining there at the table, Simon begins to wonder if he's made a mistake. In his own mind, he begins to question whether he should have invited Jesus to come for this banquet. First of all, this woman her behavior is completely inappropriate for the setting. But also, he's told all of his guests that he's inviting a prophet to come and share with them. And apparently, Jesus isn't a prophet because if he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. And Luke doesn't elaborate on that. He doesn't tell us explicitly anything about this woman's background. But we get the impression that this woman may have been a Jewish prostitute, or she could have simply had the reputation of being promiscuous. The fact that she had a, a jar of 
alabaster oil, this ointment. It would have been a tool of her trade if she was a prostitute. And so this would have been very uh, difficult for the, the sensitivity of the religious people. They would have been offended by this act. And so as, as Simon is sitting there embarrassed, regretting the decisions that he's made, ironically, Jesus knows his thoughts. And he says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And so Jesus begins to tell a parable. He tells a parable about two people who are in debt. They owe a loan officer 500 denarii, and the other owes 50. A denarii was equivalent to a day laborer's wage for one day. And neither one of them could pay. The one who, who owed 500 denarii, the one who owed 50 denarii, neither one of them could repay. And so the loan officer simply cancels their debt. Jesus asks Simon, which one do you think would love him more? In Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke, there wasn't a word for gratitude. And so Luke uses this word, love. Which one is going to show the greater amount of appreciation? Which one is going to be full of gratitude? And Simon responds, well, the one who owed more. And then Jesus says, you've answered correctly. And then Jesus stops and he looks at this woman, this person who's caused the scene. And he asks Simon, do you see this woman? Look at her. Do you see her? It would be interesting to go through the Gospels and see how many times that Jesus stops and he simply looks at a person. That he stops and acknowledges their presence. When he stops to acknowledge their humanity. And it appears that Simon hasn't taken the time to look at this woman. He's only taken the time to judge her. He's only taken the time to assume that her behavior is inappropriate. And the impression that I get when I read this story is that Simon has become so preoccupied with how this is going to make him look as the host that he's failed to consider this woman's actions as being right on target. Jesus tells Simon, well, when I came in, you didn't offer me anything to wash my feet. But this woman, she, she washed my feet. She hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. She, she anointed my feet with oil, and you didn't an, even anoint my head. And we know from stories like Jesus washing his disciples' feet that it wasn't expected for, for a, a rabbi, for anyone, to wash another person's feet. In fact, this was considered inappropriate or taboo. And so Jesus would not have come to this gathering, to this banquet, expecting for Simon to wash his feet. But the common customs of hospitality was to at least provide a basin of water, to provide the opportunity for Jesus to cleanse his own feet. And so the implicit message that Jesus is conveying in this story is, Simon, you're getting caught up in your own emotions 
and you failed to see that this woman is doing your job for you. You haven't extended the right kind of hospitality, but she is the one who is doing your job. And it's all because of her gratitude. It's all because she has encountered Jesus and Jesus has changed her life. When I was in the second grade, my parents took me to get my eyes examined for the first time. My teacher had warned my mom that I had been squinting to see the chalkboard. I was kind of squinting, turning my head to the side, try to make sense of, of what she was writing. And so when we went to the optometrist that day, it seemed inevitable that I was going to be walking away with a prescription. I was the youngest of three kids. Both of my parents, both of my older siblings all wore glasses. It, it, it seemed impossible for me to walk away that day without getting a prescription. After all the exams were over, not only did we come to find that I needed glasses, we learned that my vision was more impaired than everyone else in my family. And to put things into perspective, both of my parents were in their early 40s at that point, and they were both wearing bifocals. Here I was in the second grade, and my vision was worse than theirs. I'll never forget the day that my glasses came in the mail. They came in a little cardboard box. My mom opened the packaging and she put them on my face. And immediately I was overwhelmed. The prescription was so strong. I started getting dizzy and a headache. I felt nauseated. And so I begged my parents to let me take a break. I just can't take, I can't take it. And so after wearing my glasses for about 20 minutes, my mom finally let me take them off. And when I did, I couldn't see anything. Everything was just blurry, just shapes and colors. There was no definition to anything. And I was horrified because I thought my prescription was so strong that it was causing me to go blind. And so I ran to my mom and explained to her what had happened. And she said, Jonathan, the glasses haven't ruined your vision. The problem is that this is the way that you had always seen the world. You just never knew it. You had always lived with this stigmatism. You just didn't know any better. But now you're looking at the world through a different lens. And you're catching up on what you've missed all along. I think this analogy applies to the way that we often see the world. Most of the time, we, it never really even occurs to us that we see the world a certain way. We just think that the world is as it appears to us. But the truth is that all of us see the world through a certain lens. And experts say that it's dependent upon our particular social location. And that's just a fancy way of saying that our experiences shape the way that we see the world. It's not really rocket science. But what this means is that I see the world a certain way because of the fact that I am a white male who grew up in suburban West Virginia, who grew up in a white-collar family. I see the world a certain way because of my religious upbringing. I see the world a, a, through a certain lens because of my education because I'm the youngest of three children, and really the list goes on and on. And if I'm not careful, I can just assume that the way I see the world 
is the way things at are that it's as they really are. But I'm really looking at the world just through my eyes. And until I take the time to look through another lens, I might not even realize that other perspectives even exist. And so when we bring it back to this story, and we begin to think about the experiences of these two people, they're both looking at Jesus, but they're looking at Jesus through a different set of lenses. Simon has grown up in a family that afforded him the opportunity to get an education, to become a Pharisee. He probably knows the Hebrew scriptures like the back of his hand. And we might get the impression that Simon has it all figured out. He's been trained. He knows the, the proper etiquette to host a banquet. He has the respect of his peers who are willing to come and listen to Jesus. He's not quite sure who Jesus is yet. He's kind of on the fence. He's not sure if Jesus is a prophet or, or what. And then you have this woman. She's anonymous. She doesn't have a name in this story. We don't really know much about her. But we can guess that maybe she had a troubled life. Maybe she didn't have the same experiences. Maybe she didn't have the same opportunities that Simon had. She's made different choices than Simon, and it's led her down a different path in life. But these two people, they are looking at Jesus through two totally different sets of lenses. And as we read this story, we get the impression that Simon just assumes that he's right and this woman is wrong. That he's got it all together and that this woman's behavior is completely inappropriate and embarrassing. That he's going to have to apologize to Jesus. He's going to have to apologize to his guests. But I think where the rubber really meets the road, when we look at the story is that this woman, her perspective, her lens, the way that she sees the world, has been transformed by grace. And so everything that flows out of her is gratitude. She's so grateful for what God has done, that God has rescued her and redeemed her and given her a new opportunity to start over in life. And the irony of the story is that Simon hasn't yet figured out that he needs that same grace just as much. If we look back at the parable that Jesus teaches, he says that there are two debtors and neither of them could repay their debt. This is true of Simon this is true of this woman. Neither of them could repay their debt. And yet, forgiveness was extended to both of them. This woman, she's received forgiveness. Her life is full of love and hope and joy and peace. And Simon hasn't quite figured out who Jesus is yet. He hasn't figured out that he needs grace. And so he's not looking through that same lens. That same grace has not transformed his heart and his life. I think this story can speak to us today because we live in a world where our nation is so incredibly divided. And it's because we see through different lenses. I like to think that I'm right. You like to think that you're right. But the truth is that we need to be willing to give each other the benefit of the doubt. The story teaches us that Simon just uh, simply assumes that this woman is wrong. 
when Jesus points out the fact that this woman has something to teach him, that she knows what it means to be a host, that she knows what it means to offer hospitality, because she understands who Jesus is. She's seeing Jesus through the proper lens, and Jesus is telling Simon that he has something to learn. And so as I listen to the story, as I reflect upon it, I can't help but to think that grace transforms the way that we see things. So much. The way that we look at other people. If we happen to have the tendency to just immediately judge someone or condemn someone, or to just demonize another person because they're different than us, then perhaps it's because we haven't received the grace that we need. Doesn't mean we have to agree with everyone. Doesn't mean that we all have to think the same way. But grace changes what we choose to see. And in this story, Jesus compels Simon to look. Look at this woman. Do you see her? Do you see her? Do you see this woman? Today, I want to compel you to look at the world around you. The people in your lives who might be different than you, who think differently than you, who have a different expression of faith than you do, who experience God in a different way, and consider what might they have to teach me? Have I become so preoccupied with myself and and the events of the world and how it's affecting me personally to the point that I'm unwilling to look at others, that I'm unwilling to see them in their own circumstances, that I'm unwilling to see them where They are. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that grace shapes the things that we choose to see. And this woman, she chooses to see Jesus as her Savior, her Redeemer, the one that she needs. My hope and prayer for those of you who are listening today is that you'll spend some moments in quiet, in prayer. And you'll listen for God's Holy Spirit to speak into your life. That you'll consider maybe the ways that you need to be forgiven. The ways that you need to receive God's grace. My hope and my prayer is that today, that each and every one of us will take the time to to take our eyes off of ourselves and to look at other people, to see others, because grace points us away from ourselves, to see the men and the women, the boys and the girls that Christ puts in our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen.